We have time for a Q&A. And we ask that anyone who asks a question, please state your name first and, uh, and ask your question briefly and then pass the mic back because we want to fit in as many questions as possible for our panel. So do we have any hands on this side of the auditorium? Here's one. My name's Mary Fitzgerald. My question is, how do we change this? And are you optimistic that that can be done or not? Why don't we all take a shot at that? <laughs> well, from the political side, uh, the, the bottom line of what I was saying before about uh, controlling access to the ballot uh, and redistricting so that uh, in order to move forward with your political career, you have to appeal not to the general public, but to you know a very small subset of the most ideological who participate uh, in, in the primary system and, and so forth. The, the, the truth is incentives work, and we have to change the incentive so that you cannot get to power you know, by catering to small extremes. And so am I optimistic? I am. Uh, in 2006, the, the state of Washington said, we're not going to put up with this anymore. We're going to change the laws. We're going to create open primaries where, can't, where the voters can choose among all the qualified voters, I mean, among all the qualified candidates, and all the voters choose among them, and they have to appeal to all of us and win the support from all of us uh, in order to get elected. They also took away from the parties the ability to control congressional redistricting, turned those over to nonpartisan independent commissions. Uh, that was in 2006, 2010. California did exactly the same thing. Arizona is voting on it next week. Uh, so I, I think the trend is for people to say, we, we can't continue this dysfunction that's based on party versus party all the time. We have to put the power back in the hands of the people. And I think the revolution is beginning. Well, Mickey, Mickey may be a little more uh, optimistic than I am, but <laughs> I guess the way I have thought about it, particularly from the point of view of the judiciary, is I'm waiting for the moment when both sides have been frustrated so much with the way things are working that people finally do decide to sit down and see if a better process can be crafted. And I'm reminded, you may think this is far afield, but I'm reminded of what happened with military base closings, which were a politically impossible task until a new system was created to change, as you said, the incentives to change people's um, ability to influence. There was still a possibility for Congress to stop things, but. Uh, once the list was there and your base was on the list to be closed, it was much more difficult to, to stop it. With, with judicial confirmations, at this point, we de facto have a rule that you need 60 senators on board with any particular judge before the confirmation will happen. It's very easy to stop 60 people. Nobody's quite perfect enough you know, not to have, and would you really want them to be a judge, frankly, if they were? Um, <laughs> So, so the, the process has hurt Republicans, it's hurt Democrats, there seems to be a ratcheting function going on that every time somebody blocks you know, 10 people of one president, the next time around it's gotta be 12 people, the next president, on, up, on and on and on. So I hope that some new institution can be created. I will say, having just sat on the Wisconsin three-judge court, which assessed Wisconsin's redistricting, the California example and the other examples uh, were brought to our attention. Both Wisconsin and Illinois, uh, mirror images of one another, went through a phenomenally partisan uh, redistricting process. In Wisconsin, it was all the Republicans. In Illinois, it was all the Democrats. And uh, I can tell you it was not an edifying process to look and see you know, a district that needed 10,000 people added to it in fact had 110,000 people added and 100,000 subtracted just to make sure the lines would work out right. There's nothing much one can do about it under the present system, but if the states really get serious about changing things, maybe it will. Um, on the Supreme Court side, I guess I would say I'm, I'm not optimistic, but there are possibilities. Um, one possibility is that, is that justices are, at least to some degree, um, attuned to their legacies. 
And I think that to the extent that there is um, sharp criticism of the behavior of a court, that they hear it and that they rein in a bit uh, some of their um, behavior. Uh, but there's a really perverse uh, institutional effect, exactly the, the opposite, in fact, of what Judge Wood was saying, having to do with the filibuster. And this, this works in a somewhat different way for the Supreme Court than it might for the lower court judges. Um, in the following sense, the court has become so politicized that one can imagine a scenario where, since you need more than 60 votes to kill a filibuster, um, where neither the Republicans nor the Democrats in the Senate will confirm any Supreme Court nominee who has the slightest taint of being liberal or conservative. And in effect, force more moderate nominees to be presented and those being the only ones that would be con confirmed. Um, I think that the, the degree of, of deference that historically was given in the confirmation process um, has collapsed in recent years. And at one level, that seems terrible. But at this other level, it may actually turn out perversely to be a good thing. Because it may be that President Romney or President Obama simply could not appoint an ideological justice anymore. That the, the opposing side in the Senate will not confirm. And so we will be, they'll be forced into presenting more justices who wind up more or less in the middle. And those justices aren't necessarily better justices, but it would help alleviate some of the polarization in the court. My name is John Dunn, and uh, I come from the trenches. I served 20 years in the Illinois General Assembly as a Democrat from downstate in Decatur, not too far from Champaign. And I've thought a lot about the problems we're talking about here tonight. I served 1975 to 1995. The first four terms I served in Springfield, we had those three-member districts. The white hairs in this room will remember those. And in each district, both parties were represented. Two Democrats and one Republican, or two Republicans and one Democrat. And I spent four years, or four terms, in the General Assembly with moderation being the key. You could not get too extreme because there were both parties in your district and they would cut your legs off. People in this room uh, are from the North Shore, you probably remember Harold Katz maybe, uh, maybe you remember Aaron Jaffe, who's currently the chair of the Gaming Commission. Both of them would have, Harold could not get elected, Aaron got elected once afterwards. In 1982, our current governor, Pat Quinn. Sir, you got, you got to be a question. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, the, 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 there's not a question, it's a statement. We need to go back to no, three member no. districts. You got to be a question. Question, why don't we go back to three member districts? Or why don't we have six people in each primary and Thanks. we need to turn things around? That'll, one of those two will happen. Good, thank you. Mickey? Well, I, I, whether, whether it's multi-candidate uh, districts or any other form, uh, the goal needs to be uh, to increase the voice of the people by giving them the biggest range of options available so that they can size up all the possible legislators or members of Congress, the House, Senate, uh, that are presented to them weigh them individually and then make the choice. So whether you do it that way or you do it through open primary systems, you know, the key is to put the power back in the hands of the people generally as opposed to small partisan ideological groups. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Okay, my name is Judith Barnard. Uh, I used to hear that the court followed the election returns. I don't know if that was ever true, but it. It, is it now in any way that the court is aware of or cares about what the voters feel? Um, yeah, I think that, that there's some element of truth in that, um, in that concept, although I think it's easily overstated. Um, it's true in, in two respects. First of all, if, if, um, uh, if, if the people elect Mitt Romney, they're gonna get a different Supreme Court in the future than if they elect Barack Obama. And in that sense, the court does follow the results of presidential elections just because the makeup of the court reflects the outcomes of those elections. That's one element of it. And the other is that, as I said before, the, the justices are aware of their uh, standing in the society. And if, if public attitudes change uh, in important respects, then the justices are themselves as part of the society 
uh, affected by that. And they may themselves think differently about issues, um, and they may also um, either become more aggressive or less aggressive uh, about the way they think about particular problems, depending upon um, how they see the, the, the American people thinking about those issues. Dan, you yeah, let me just add a, a, a thought or two. There are two different ways in which that might happen. One of them is through the people who come to the court, and the other is through the thinking of the justices themselves, whose position doesn't change from election to election. And with respect to the first one, you know, we live in a society where people are living longer and longer. Justices are staying longer and longer on the court. Uh, people live into their 90s, and they're still very sharp and entirely able to be on the court, as Justice Stevens was when he chose to step down. And so we have an institution that's actually less dynamic than the one the framers of the Constitution probably thought they were creating when average lifespans were significantly uh, less. Now, whoever is elected next Tuesday may or may not have an appointment on the Supreme Court over the next four years. It depends entirely on what happens to uh, any particular member of the court and whether they health forces them to step down or whether something else happens or whether they just decide to stay. Uh, President Carter famously had no uh, appointments. Uh, it, it does happen. So the court may or may not follow the election returns. It's a very slow changing institution. And as, as are the lower courts, I like to tell people, you know, you may think elections change America, but for me, the Reagan administration is current events. Uh, <laughs> I, I work with quite a few people who were appointed by President Reagan uh, to, the, to my court. Um, as to the other thing, do, do election turns, returns sway the thinking of people on the court? I doubt it does too much. Um, I think at least as to the current members of the court, they've spoken very aggressively both inside their opinions uh, on the court and in outside forums about how they approach things, and I don't see much chance that that's likely to change. We have a question on this side. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Diane Kessler. I'm wondering if any of you would care to speak about the process of electing the president having the uh, electoral college rather than a pure public uh, vote. Nikki, you want first try that? Yeah, well first let, let me say, I, I, I am aware that we're electing a president. Uh, and and, and I, I know it's a, it's a cool job. You know, they get a nice house. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I hope you all are focused on as well uh, is the elections to Congress where all of the major powers of the federal government reside over war, taxes, spending, uh, who sits in the cabinet, who sits on the Supreme Court. All of those are legislative decisions, not presidential decisions. So I hope you're following those races uh, as well. Um, yeah, I, I think that what we, what we have developing, and this is kind of off of uh, what you said, but uh, I don't, we, we don't know a whole lot, you know, other than whatever uh, preconceptions we bring, uh, whatever party identity or whatever we bring to this right now, about where all of this is going, because um, we, we've had a campaign uh, that tells me nothing about uh, either of the presidential candidates, other than the fact that they hate the other one. Uh, and that uh, their campaigns are, ba whether it's Obama's campaign or uh, Romney's campaign, based largely on the fact that the other person is a total disqualified, totally disqualified person, you know, to hold public office or even be a citizen. So, um, <laughs> I, I mean, so that, that's, my, you know, I think we have to get beyond that in terms of assessing, you know, the people that we are looking at and how we're evaluating uh, who should be holding our highest offices. I know it's not where, you know, exactly where your question was going, but I, I think that's the fundamental problem right now. We, we're not having intelligent, thoughtful, reasonable conversations about alternatives and where we want our country to go. And it's a shame that we've gone through this political campaign uh, not furthering the process, but actually uh, eroding it. I think we have a question on the far side. Wait, what, one second. Uh, wait, one second. I, let me say just a word because I think you raise a very important point about the Electoral College. And, and here in Illinois, 
or down in Texas, where my family largely lives, you would barely know that there is a presidential election going on because everybody, quote, knows that Illinois' electoral votes are going to go for Obama, and everybody knows Texas's electoral votes are going to go for Romney. So unless you happen to live in Ohio or one of another handful of states, uh, the way the system has evolved has unfortunately led to a sense of disenfranchisement for the, the many Democrats who live in Texas or the many Republicans who live in Illinois. And people are starting seriously to wonder, is there some way that you could even abolish winner takes all in the Electoral College? And it would have to be done collectively. There's no way one state could be there and other states not. But I think this concept of battleground states is not something that existed when I first started voting a million years ago, uh, and I don't think it's a positive development. I, do, I want to add, too, that I, I think that the, um, the, the way that the, the Electoral College now operates with all of the polls and the sensitivity and, and sophistication that the candidates have and their, and their campaigns have about you know, where the money is, where the, but I don't mean money now, the votes are. Um, votes, money. Right, same thing, right, votes, money, same thing, right. Um, <laughs> Uh, th that actually then distorts the popular vote. So what happens is that, and this you can see in past elections, the turnout in those states like Illinois and Texas um, is much lower than the turnout in states like Iowa, Virginia, and Ohio because people don't feel they have the same stake, even though there are all the other positions that are being filled. And so you wind up with a popular vote difference, which is distorted by, because of the existence of the electoral vote. So if we even compare the electoral vote to the popular vote, it's not clear you're any longer comparing two things that should be um, treated as alike. I also want to tell a story very quickly, which I told Diane and, and Mickey earlier, because, but it's just too good not to tell. And uh, um, it, it is somewhat relevant to this topic. It's a true story, true story. So a friend of mine who works in the White House called me a week or so ago and said that, um, he had been with the president, and the president um, told him this event. So the a congressman from Ohio uh, wanted to had, had a meeting scheduled with, with President Obama and asked if he could bring his five-year-old son to the Oval Office, which the president said, sure. And so the son from Ohio comes into the office, and the president goes up and says to the, to the child, um, do you know who I am? And the kid looks up at him and says, you're Obama. And the president says, right. He says, and do you know what my job is? And the little boy looks up and says, um, you're the president. And President Obama says, right. He says, do you know what I do? And the little boy looks up and says, you approve this message. <laughs> this is the true story. That tells you about where we are in this country. <laughs> Actually, that statement about uh, battleground states is a great segue to this because I'm actually I'm, I'm I, I live in Illinois. With, I call it Democratic Disneyland. I know where my votes are going, uh, but even though I'm a Democrat mostly, I kind of feel disenfranchised because I'm extremely pro gay rights. I'm all about universal single payer health, but I am really against public sector unions. Sorry, teachers. Uh, but the thing is, because we live in this society where, thanks to Martin Van Buren, we got these disinterested coalitions where you know, if I vote for the other party, I'm also buying into a coalition that involves people who are against gay rights, people who are for insurers and whatnot. Um, it's like I'm forced to side with sort of like the democratic coalition, even though there's aspects of that that I don't approve of, but, but my state's always gonna go for that. Um, you know, Thomas Jefferson said that constitution should have expiration dates. Could the United States, the entire United States, if it had to draft a new constitution, achieve consensus? Would it be easier to achieve consensus on a state level? And if so, would my view, maybe there'd be nuances within my view with people who share my views in, United, in Illinois that I could vote for someone where it's like, oh, gay rights is in our constitution, so I don't have to worry about that, and I can vote for the person who might be against public sector unions. Thank you. Mickey? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, I just go back to what I said before. I mean, I think you have to open it up where everybody, you know, the, the, let's say, you know, I, I'm willing to bet you're not the only person who feels exactly that way, you know, that you don't buy into either the Democrat platform or the Republican uh, platform lock, stock, and barrel, you know, that, that, and so what you want to do is find the candidate who thinks the way you do, 
or comes closest to thinking that you, the way you do, and that person is legitimately on the ballot and can make his or her appeal to all of the voters. So I mean, that that's what you have to do because I don't know any other way. You, you know, to if you buy into that what you're voting for is a party, and we continue to have that be, you're going to have what? What does the Republican Party stand for? It stands for a moderate or a liberal, if that's who won the nomination of that party in that district. It stands for a conservative Tea Party, or, you know, if that's who won the nomination. They don't have principles other than power. Uh, and so you need to find ways that you can take people who share your views and, and find candidates who do have these nuances and these mixes of different uh, perspectives. I, I think you probably are very much like most people who aren't, you know, in either in category A or category B. Okay, we have time for one more question, and then we're going to hear from Leslie Berlowitz, the president of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Oh, hi, uh, Evan Kane. Um, can you address the failure of the fourth estate in its, uh, in its job of protecting the common good and how that affects the issues that you brought up? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't have... A, a, a good answer in terms of why, but the even the responsible media tends not to be so responsible. Um, in, in some sense, they've they've given up, and this is just my own personal impression of things. Um, they've given up trying to exercise good judgment about what positions and what arguments are worth taking seriously. It's all sort of become, you know, on the one hand, on the other hand. And no matter how crazy one side or the other is, they're all equal. Um, so that's one aspect of it that I think is deeply troubling, and I, I don't really know why that's happened. Uh, the other side of it, of course, is that the, the cable news and talk radio and the internet have profoundly changed the public discourse in the United States. And for the most part, I think it's probably clear not for the better. Um, I, I'm always stunned when I talk to people who um, I, I, I have an opportunity to have a conversation with who uh, have these, in my view at least, totally twisted conceptions of reality. <laughs> um, I mean, and, I mean they, on either side, you know, they, they, they believe that, you know, that, that Barack Obama is not a citizen, or they believe that, that, that George W. Bush planned 9-11. Um, it's nuts. And I, I don't, you know, and that's being fed terribly by the internet and by other reckless forms of, of communication. And I don't know how we fix that, but I think that's a terrible problem for democracy. Um, did, did you want to go? Uh, I, you know, I have, uh, let, let me, four quick points, because that, that, that is, what, what a terrific, important question that is. You know, part of what's happening with the media and the rise of the internet and, and eBay and all this stuff is uh, the, the major news media have lost uh, a lot of, they, they have to lay off staff, they don't have the resources anymore, uh, they get younger and younger people. I've read, I read two stories in the New York Times this morning, you know, that, that you're just reading them. I mean, whoever wrote them, and they, these were, you know, were wrong. I mean, they simply did not know what they were talking about. And th this was, you know, a, a, certainly a major paper. Uh, a second point, um, it, you know, I'm anti-violent. I won't even go to a violent movie. But, but the only violence I've ever advocated is that you take Keith Oberman and Rush Limbaugh and put them in a bag and drop them off a bridge together. I thought that would... Uh, that, that, there's two additional thoughts to that, though, and I'm very quickly. One is the problem to some extent uh, is we have... We have you, you can point to Limbaugh and you can point to Oberman and Beck and all the other... All the, you know, but at the top of that chain, there are people who own those networks and who own those stations and who are the investors in them who are getting away with poisoning our political system and raking in the bucks by doing it. Uh, and then the final thing, and I don't want to end by turning this back on you, but one of my good friends, Bill Bishop, wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Big Sort, uh, and Bill Clinton talks about it a lot. I do. You should read it. But, but he points to, as some other people point to, the fact that we as a people have become 
the, the kinds of people who only talk to people who think the way they do, who read the same. You either read George Will or Paul Krugman, but you don't read both. I don't mean you, you all are the exception. But, uh, <laughs> but we do have a problem here with public intelligent discourse in our society, not just in the media, and that is something we have to address as a people too. First, I would like to thank the festival for suggesting that the top of, topic America be the topic you examine this year. I think there's no more important topic for this country, so thank the festival. There is a perhaps apocryphal story about Benjamin Franklin that he was being stopped on a street in Philadelphia at the conclusion of the Constitutional Convention and a concerned citizen said, well, doctor, what do we have? And Franklin was reported to have replied, a republic, if you can keep it. Ensuring the success of this 200 plus year experiment in democracy requires informed and engaged citizens, such as yourself, and the citizens that were just called for by Mickey and Diane and Jeff. What we have to do is not on, only concern ourselves with the talk we hear, but also with the education of the next generation of citizens and invest in that because without educated citizens, those four early presidents who didn't want parties also didn't want ignorant people. Since 1780, the objective of the academy, the American Academy, has been to share difficult problems and to try to sort them out and, and proclaim on them for the public good. It is, after all, all of our tasks to keep the republic. We would like to invite you and think of this as a somewhat virtual town meeting and have you send us your own thoughts about what we can do as an academy to further advance the republic. Um, our email is humanities that should be easy for you to remember, at A-M-A-C-A-D, amacad, dot org. And we really look forward to hearing from you. Thank you all for coming, and now especially, let's thank our speakers. And in the tradition of the founders, and this isn't just a rumor, it is now my privilege to dissolve the 1,989th meeting of the American Academy. <laughs>